Today we have a, uh, something I think a person speaking you'll certainly enjoy. Ms. Mon Jokadar. He, Mon is Associate Professor of Internal Medicine in, in the Division of Cardiology. He's also the core curriculum director for uh, adult congenital disease. Uh, Mon went to school and med school at the University of Damascus. He was there for six years. I can vouch it was not because he flunked any courses because Mon's a very bright guy. I had the pleasure of working with him when he was a cardiology fellow and he, he really is a treat to be there. After leaving uh, University of Damascus, he went to Mayo Clinic where he spent time there as first as in a research training program and then as a resident. And from there came to Emory and served as uh, a fellow. And it's impressive to me, Mon, that you've got boards in internal medicine, you've got boards in adult congenital disease, you've got boards in, in uh, echocardiography, and you've got boards in advanced heart failure and transplant. So it's your well-traveled man. We're pleased to have you on the faculty here. Other things I think are important about mine is that he has worked hard and, and, and is active both on a local scene and he's, in pre he's present on some of the committees locally, but he also has continued to work with physicians from the Mideast on the international scene, and I think is, is well recognized from that. The other thing I guess mine is he's probably got more awards for being the best teacher than I know. He's, when he was a resident, he was selected as the best resident teacher. When he was a fellow, he was selected as the best fellow teacher. When he got to be a faculty member, he was selected as the best faculty person. So uh, a lot to be proud of, and, and we certainly appreciate you coming in today. And, and I would say that the other thing I would say about mine is he's not only a good educator, but he has a little uh, gamesmanship in his talks, and so I think you'll You'll be informed, but you'll also enjoy the presentations. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Morris. Very generous introduction. Thank you. So the title of my talk is Observation, Serendipity, and Personality, Lessons from the History of Medicine. And this is something, a topic that's uh, very interested in, uh, and I think there's a lot to be learned uh, from some of these stories. I have no conflicts of interest. The learning objectives for today are to recognize some of the factors that influence medical discoveries and how these discoveries are adopted. And really what it's about is why some bad ideas are often adopted and why sometimes really good ideas are ignored for a while and take time to catch on. And I'm going to through this little journey for the next few minutes, we're going to go over some stories that many of you are familiar with. A lot of us know what happened, but my, I'm more interested in why they happened and, and how they, they happened, because uh, I think there's uh, a lot of uh, to be learned there. I'll start out with a couple of quotes. One of my favorite authors, Mark Twain, said, it ain't what you don't know that gets you into trouble. It's what you know for sure that just ain't so. And the second quote by Sir Winston Churchill, the farther back you look back, uh, the, the farther back you look, the farther forward you are likely to see. And this is my take home point. My take home point is to keep an open mind, to embrace the uncertainties of our everyday lives and to question the status quo and always be humble because history is a very harsh judge. How many of us have come across a patient who uh, is taking herbal remedies and we're, you know, a little bit dismissive of what these herbal remedies may contain? Uh, well, this actually happened to Sir, uh, to William Withering. Dr. William Withering um, was, went to, he was a, a Scotsman who went to uh, Edinburgh uh, Medical School and um, he began medical practice in Shropshire and the Birmingham General Hospital. And then he uh, fell in love with one of his first patients who was very interested in botany. And uh, through their relationship, he learned a lot about botany and, and, uh, and became interested in all the local, all the local uh, uh, plants. And then one day in 1775, he was treating a patient with dropsy. Dropsy is the term for heart failure. And invariably in the old days, it was due to 
uh, mitral stenosis, rheumatic mitral stenosis. And there was really no adequate treatment for dropsy at that time, for rheumatic mitral stenosis at that time. So he gave his patient a grim prognosis and told him that he would see him on the other side. Well, time elapsed and his patient recovered and he saw him uh, uh, in coincidence in the, in the marketplace. And he asked him how he got better. And he uh, told the story of uh, going to old Mother Hutton of uh, Shropshire and she gave him this herbal tea. So Dr. Withering investigated. He, instead of dismissing this idea that some herbal tea, something he didn't understand, he went and actually investigated, tracked down old Mother Hutton and asked her for her recipe. Uh, initially, she declined, but after some money exchanged hands, she gave him a bag full of uh, various components. Because of his interest and knowledge in botany, he immediately recognized that the active ingredient must have been the foxglove. This beautiful flower, foxglove, beautiful flower named for the Bavarian scientist Leonard Fuchs. And um, these thimble-shaped flowers, beautiful shaped flowers, you can fit your digit in them. You can, that's why the, the term is digitalis, digitalis purpura, for these beautiful poisonous thimble-shaped uh, flowers. And uh, over the next 10 years, he would experiment without IRB approval on 156 patients with various uh, 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 dosing regimens. He would uh, describe in exquisite detail the toxicities, including bradycardia and visual changes uh, that occurred to some of his, uh, uh, some of his patients. Um, and then he was getting ready to uh, present his findings. And he was discussing them with uh, his friend Erasmus Darwin, who is none other than the grandfather of, uh, of uh, Charles Darwin, the uh, uh, of, of evolution. And uh, Erasmus Darwin went ahead and scooped him and went and presented the, the data for him uh, at, the, uh, at the Royal College of Physicians. So here you have a a situation of uh, medical plagiarism. Uh, Darwin plagiarizing, uh, plagiarizing Withering, and obviously Withering not giving any uh, credit at all to old Mother Hutton. Now obviously most of our herbal remedies today are probably not particularly uh, useful, but one you know, recent example might be um, vinegar, acetic acid for weight loss. There actually is a Japanese double-blind controlled trial showing that uh, uh, 30 milliliters of acetic acid is better than 15, better than placebo at weight loss. So that's one th sort of thing to, to think about. Another story I have is about the ability to change direction in one's investigation and one's career. And this is the story of warfarin. So in the 1920s and 1930s, cows across the U.S. and Canada in the Midwest were dropping dead. They were bleeding to death. Nobody really figured out exactly why this was occurring. And then during the abyss of America's Greatest Depression in 1933, it, it became intolerable. Farmers were losing everything. So uh, legend has it that uh, farmer Ed Carlson got fed up in the middle of a snowstorm, middle of a blizzard. And he drove to the closest university, University of, uh, of Wisconsin in Madison, and it was a blizzard. All the, all the, the buildings were closed except for one. He saw the light. And he, he, he went to that light, he, he barged in, he barged into this guy's office carrying a bucket of bloody milk and plopped it right there, spilling bloody milk all over the guy's floor. And he said, you gotta figure out what's going on with my bleeding cows. And if you like, I have a dead cow in the back of my truck. Please figure it out. And the guy he walked into his office was none other than Dr. Paul Link, uh, Carl Link rather. And Dr. Carl Link went ahead and discovered the missing link. And he uh, figured out the uh, mechanism by which uh, these cows were dying to death, were bleeding to death. So one of my favorite smells is the smell of cut grass, the sweet smell of cut grass. That smell is coumarin, coumarins. And that um, is metabolized by a fungus if you allow, if you allow uh, uh, coumarin, which is uh, abundant in certain haze, like uh, like a sweet clover, it's metabolized by this by uh, a fungus from the penicillin family into dicumarol. And dicumarol 
you know, uh, is a blood thinner, and we all know the mechanism of warfarin, preventing the recycling of vitamin K and inactivation of uh, uh, blood, uh, blood clotting factors. So warfarin stands for Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation, warfarin. And it was initially marketed as a rodenticide because no one thought, I mean, it never occurred to anybody to use it as a, as a blood thinner. Until in 1951, a U.S. Army inductee attempted suicide with rat poison. By that time, they figured out that you could use vitamin K as an antidote, so they gave vitamin K, and someone had the idea maybe we could use this as a blood thinner because all they had at that time was intravenous heparin, and this was, a, uh, was an, oral, uh, an oral agent. So uh, some investigations were underway. And then, in 1955, the President of the United States at the time President uh, uh, Dwight Eisenhower, while on vacation, a golfing vacation, visiting his in-laws in Denver, had a heart attack, large anterior myocardial infarction. And a couple of days after his myocardial infarction, uh, they noticed a bulge on the chest X-ray, indicating a probable uh, aneurysm of the anterior wall. And they had uh, uh, called in um, uh, called in uh, some uh, cardiologists from uh, from all over, inc including Dr. Paul Dudley White, who was Dr. Willis Hurst's mentor at the uh, Massachusetts General Hospital. And he gave the President of the United States rat poison, which was a little bit scandalous at the time, a little bit, uh, a little bit brave at that time. Imagine giving the President of the United States uh, warfarin, and he prescribed 35 milligrams a week. And he gave him 35 milligrams a week, and, uh, and uh, uh, President Eisenhower was able to return to work. He still had several embolic events and was probably incapacitated during several episodes of his uh, presidency, but that's a topic for a different uh, lecture. What, what's interesting to me is how nimble and willing Dr. Link was to completely change the direction of his research. He was a guy who was a chemist uh, who was studying carbohydrate metabolism. And here someone presented a very important problem, and he was not tied down by huge grants, not tied down by other things, and the university gave him the flexibility to completely change direction, and the next six years of his life was dedicated to solving this very important uh, question. And this is the medicine we still use, love it or hate it, it's the medicine we still use every day. My next story is about um, penicillin, and um, uh, a fortuitous observation of penicillin and we all know the story of Sir Alexander Fleming. Sir Al Alexander uh, Fleming was a Scottish biologist who uh, was working at St. Mary's uh, in London. And he was a guy who was uh, uh, very hardworking but very messy. He left stuff and clutter all over the place. And this would actually serve him well. By the way, this argument does not work well on my wife. But uh, so he had clutter all over the place. And, and uh, one day, he was battling a cold. He still showed up to work. And he had mucus dripping from his nose while working with various uh, uh, bacteria cultures. And a drop of mucus fell on his nose onto a bacteria culture. And this, after a couple of days, created a halo of no growth. And through this, he discovered lysozyme, lysozyme. And, um, and uh, a few years later, five years later, he went on vacation and left a whole bunch of petri dishes uncovered. His office door was open, and we all know the story. A fungus from a different lab wafted through the air into his lab and onto a petri dish of, uh, of bacteria. And a similar phenomenon occurred of an area of, uh, of lysis where bacteria were not growing, and this is how he discovered, uh, uh, he discovered this because of... Uh, uh, because of his messiness, and he discovered penicillin notatum. Initially, he didn't realize that this could be a therapeutic benefit. He didn't really, you know, he published it, but he didn't go out talking about it and, and uh, saying how important it was. He wasn't a particularly good public speaker. He wasn't a particularly good champion for this revolutionary discovery. Until 10 years elapse. 10 years elapse, and um, uh, a gentleman from Australia and a, uh, uh, a gentleman from Berlin who fled the, uh, the Holocaust uh, uh, working in London at Oxford discovered the importance of, uh, of penicillin. And uh, Dr. Flory and Dr. Chain um, 
realized that it could be used as an antibiotic to kill uh, bacteria. However, it was very difficult to produce in mass. This was the middle uh, uh, during the bombardment of London, the Battle of London. Uh, there were uh, uh, a very dangerous time with limited funds, and the government of England was not particularly interested at all in pursuing this further. So they uh, contacted the United States Department of Agriculture in Peoria, Illinois. And uh, they uh, traveled in the middle of July with their overcoats on because in their overcoats they had smuggled spores. Everywhere they went, even before they traveled, they had spores of penicillin because they were afraid if their lab was bombed or if something happened that they would lose this absolutely enormous discovery, this important, uh, important gift. So they went to Prairie, Illinois, and they tried to mass produce uh, uh, penicillin with corn uh, steep liquor in 10,000 collar vats with limited success until they had the idea of finding a different penicillin species that might be a better mass producer. So they went all over Peoria looking through all grocery stores until they found a rotten cantaloupe. And legend has it, they took the cantaloupe, carefully carved away from all the area, and ate the rest. Um, and, uh, and so because of this uh, new penicillin species, they were able to mass produce uh, penicillin in time for D-Day, saved countless uh, servicemen uh, that day and, and since. And uh, one year later, they were awarded, uh, all three, uh, Fleming, Chain, and uh, Flory were awarded the uh, Nobel Prize for Physiology and Medicine for their discovery. And because of this discovery of therapeutic effects of, of, of fungi, this created a, a revolution of sorts. Uh, uh, Selman uh, Waxman uh, isolated streptomycin, which would become the very first uh, medicine to, be tr uh, to treat tuberculosis. Uh, John Burrell at Sandoz discovered cyclosporin. A uh, very interesting story there. And uh, Akira Indo uh, at a grain shop in Kyoto isolated uh, penicillin uh, citronum. And that is how uh, uh, statins were, uh, uh, were discovered. My next story is what happens to an idea when it comes prematurely before its time, when the discoverer is not a good champion for this idea. And I'm talking about hand washing. I'm talking about Ignaz Simmelweis. Ignaz Simmelweis was a uh, Hungarian. Initially, he studied law, and then he decided to, a uh, brilliant man, to study, decided to study medicine. And after completing his training, he was appointed the equivalent of a chief resident of sorts to the uh, Algemanis Krankenhaus der Stadt Wien, or the Vienna uh, General uh, Hospital. And uh, he was appointed to uh, the medical student clinic. And at that time, um, there were the medical students admitted women in labor on odd days, and the midwives admitted on alternate days. And everybody in Vienna knew, it was no secret, that you did not want to be admitted to the medical school days. You wanted to be admitted on the midwife days. They, it was common knowledge, though the doctors were completely uh, oblivious uh, and ignorant of this, um, so certain in their, in their ways, that uh, the mortality was significantly higher in, uh, in the medical school uh, clinic days. So Ignaz Simmelweis caught wind of this, and he started to study it. He was only there for two years. And he uh, was describing how the mortality was many-fold higher in the medical school clinic than it was in the midwife clinic. It's important to note that around that time, you know, the medical students in the mornings, they would do their autopsies, and they would do autopsies on women who died of childbed fever. The, the high mortality was mostly accountable to, uh, on account of sepsis, uh, childbed fever, peripheral fever, uh, streptococcal uh, illness. And, um, and uh, one day, one of uh, Dr. Simmelweis's mentors Dr. Jacob Kolechka, while doing an autopsy with a medical student, the medical student uh, cut him uh, by accident. And uh, a few days later, Dr. Kolechka died of an illness very similar to peripheral fever, very similar to, uh, to uh, childbed fever. And so a light bulb sort of started flashing in, in Ignaz Simmelweis's head. Is it possible, revolutionary idea, that particles from the dead people were somehow causing illness in the, uh, in, 
in, in uh, uh, Kolechka and other, and other patients. And he realized that the slovenly appearance, the, the, the dirty appearance of all the doctors after their autopsies, this was a badge of, of, of honor at the time to be, to be hardworking and having blood on, on one's uh, coats, um, uh, was, was probably part of the cause for this problem. So he instituted this revolutionary uh, idea of hand washing with bleach powder. And his idea was not to kill any sort of organism. At that time, uh, the entrenched uh, dogma was uh, miasma, or bad smell. He thought that maybe these particles of the cadavers, of the, of the, of the dead people who died of sepsis, had a bad smell, and somehow this bad smell caused, uh, uh, caused uh, illness. Uh, by way of interest, malaria, malaria, bad smell, that's where the word uh, for malaria uh, uh, comes, uh, comes from. So he instituted this, this, uh, this uh, revolutionary uh, technique, and there was a dramatic drop in the uh, incidence of, uh, of, uh, of uh, childbed fever. You would think this would be the end of the story. You would think that his ideas would be widely adopted, and hand washing would be instituted immediately without any resistance at that time. The problem was he was only there for two years. He was a Hungarian, and it was the time of Hungarian Revolution and the Austro-Hungarian, uh, Austro-Hungarian, uh, uh, Austro-Hungary. Here we have an incidence of politics interfering with science, something that would never happen today. Um, and uh, and uh, and his position was not renewed, and he returned. He returned to Hungary. The other thing is he was not a pleasant person. He was a bully. He was rude. When someone didn't wash his hands or follow his instructions, he would, be, he would stand over, their, uh, over them and boss them and be very rude about, uh, with his instructions. So w- one message is to be uh, kind and polite to your students. So his idea was, was, was rejected, um, including by one of the most eminent scientists of the day, Dr. Rudolf Virchow. Dr. Rudolf Virchow uh, was, uh, was a, the person who discovered uh, uh, cell theory, who discovered thrombosis, embol- uh, embolus, and he completely thought this idea was, uh, was crazy. Uh, so Simmelweis went to Hungary and he instituted his, um, his ideas in Hungary, obviously with uh, great success at that time, and uh, he sort of languished in obscurity for a while until he published uh, in 1961 uh, his, uh, his paper uh, in German, The Etiology, uh, Concept, and Prophylaxis of Childbed Fever. Um, and then in, uh, was again rejected by others, including Virchow. And in 1962, he attacked the entire community, calling them all murderers. He, he wrote a polemic uh, to all the professors of obstetrics, ca- calling them murderers. You should be washing your hands. You should be doing these things. And obviously, that's not a good way of getting your message across. And then everyone started getting fed up with him, uh, including his wife. And she put him in, in an asylum. Uh, and uh, a few days later, after being admitted, he was beaten up by guards. And another twist of irony, he himself died of sepsis. So why, again, why was this good idea not accepted? His personality, the politics of the time, the idea was dismissed by prominent members of the medical uh, community at the time, Rudolf Virchow. Um, another twist of irony, Rudolf Virchow dismantled the uh, humor hypothesis, the humor that had been uh, around since Galen and, 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 uh, and, and before. Uh, in those days, uh, uh, disease was thought to be an imbalance of humors, phlegm, uh, blood, uh, uh, ye- uh, yellow, and, and, and black bile. Um, but he dismantled this, this theory. He identified that cells, Virchow identified that cells were, the cause of, uh, were, uh, were some of the causes of disease, but completely dismissed the idea that tiny little organisms or uh, germs could be uh, contributing to disease. Again, here we have an, an, uh, a situation where you have a field entrenched in dogma. Obviously, we are immune to this today. A little bit more about germ theory. Can't do justice with germ theory with just one slide, but let me try. So um, uh, Dr. von uh, Leeuwenhoek, who wasn't a doctor, actually, he was a, um, he sold cloth. He invented the first microscope. 
And I only realized how small this thing really was. I was at the Fernbank Museum this, this weekend with my kids, and it's only about this big. The very first microscope to be able to magnify uh, 200 times. Here's a little, a little uh, uh, small ball-shaped lens, and the uh, little drop of fluid was, was put right there, and you sort of went it up to the light, and you could magnify 200 times. Um, so he, he, he invented this microscope not to look at germs, so just to count the, 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 the thread count in the various cloths he was, he was trying to sell. But by accident, with his powerful new uh, magnifying glass that he created, he was able to see the very first glimpse of germs and protozoa and other small creatures. Didn't realize that these were, uh, that some of these causes disease until uh, Agostino uh, Brassi, a uh, hundred years later, an Italian entomologist discovered that a fungus uh, caused a silkworm muscardine. But he, his ideas were uh, not adopted at the time until the rivalry between Louis Pasteur and Robert Koch uh, arrives. Louis Pasteur was interested in why wine spoiled. Little organisms in wine causes spoilage. So he would heat up the wine, not to boiling, just enough to kill these little organisms, and he would prevent, uh, he would prevent spoilage of wine. And he, uh, that, uh, that method of heating was called pasteurization, something obviously we still use today for um, and he discovered uh, rabies and anthrax uh, vaccination, vaccination and uh, uh, created the uh, Louis Pasteur Institute in 1887. There was a rivalry animosity between him and Koch. In 1870, the, uh, the uh, Franco-Prussian War was on. And obviously, here's another uh, situation where uh, politics got in the way of, of science. And uh, Koch realized that certain organisms caused certain diseases. And uh, uh, he discovered anthrax, tuberculosis, and was awarded the uh, 1905 uh, Nobel Prize. Um, he also was not immune of, of scandal, the tuberculin scandal, uh, the, uh, the tuberculin skin test we still use today. He actually, without any experimentation or anything, marketed it as a cure for tuberculosis to uh, fund his uh, divorce and uh, uh, marrying a much uh, younger woman. But that's a topic for an entirely different uh, day. Uh, Joseph uh, Lister then came around and started doing surgery using carbolic acid, using carbolic acid, very uh, a smelly, uh, oil-derived um, compound that he would spray all over his instruments, all over his hands, all over, his, uh, all over uh, the, the surgical field to prevent germs from, uh, from entering uh, or uh, germs from uh, killing germs at the scene. And then the, uh, the Germans came around, and instead of creating antiseptic, they created aseptic, uh, not allowing germs to be there in the, uh, to begin with, um, uh, strategies. But still, there were no treatments. We figured out that germs caused disease, but there were no treatments until Paul Ehrlich came around. And Dr. Paul Ehrlich um, had this idea. He could stain germs to look at them. So he figured if he could stain them, that's how you kill them. And through this flawed theory, he uh, came up with this, um, with Salversan, a dye for uh, syphilis. And it was the very first antibiotic, very first treatment for syphilis, and he was awarded the 1908 Nobel Prize for this discovery. And this, uh, this interest in, in dyes created a, an, an entire industry, IG Farben and various subsidiaries, including Bayer, same as uh, uh, Bayer Aspirin, um, Gerhard Domach, uh, another uh, German, uh, uh, German physician came around and figured that these dyes, the important compound, must be these azole, this azole bo uh, bond between the, uh, the nitrogens. And he created the very first sulfa antibiotic, Prontosil, and used it uh, as a way of interest on his own daughter when she cut her hand and had a streptococcal infection at that time would have demanded an amputation. And he was awarded the 1939 a Nobel Prize, which he was not allowed to accept at that time uh, because of the uh, uh, Nazi regime. In 1932 uh, is when Prontosil was, uh, came around. And then a few years later at the Pasteur Institute, they realized it wasn't actually the dye that caused the, uh, the therapeutic effect. It was the sulfa. When someone took Prontosil at that time, their, their body turned bright orange. Their body turned bright orange, and that was sort of uh, evidence of good therapeutic effect, uh, killing the bacteria. You turned orange, so that, so that meant the medicine was, was working. And this 
discovery of sulfa created an entire new revolution, new uh, class of medications. Many medications fall within the sulfa, within the uh, uh, sulfa uh, umbrella. Antimicrobials, including INH and uh, sulfamethoxazole, diuretics, the very first diuretics, including acetazolamide, hydrochlorothiazide, furosemide, sulfonylureas, the diabetic agents, certain uh, uh, anticonvulsants, anti-HIV medications, retrovirals, uh, sulfasalazine, uh, sotalol, ibutilide, the fetalide for the EP world, prevents it for gout, and, and, and on and on. All these medicines came around, and there was really no good mechanism of, of regulating them. Um, there was some effort in 1906, Teddy Roosevelt instituted the FDA, but it had no, it had no uh, authority over anything. And then an incident happened in 1937 where uh, there was demand for sulfa antibiotics and, um, and um, there was a demand for a liquid that children could, uh, uh, could drink instead of trying to swallow pills or, or, or uh, bad smelling, bad tasting uh, powders. So this elixir was created in, uh, by the uh, Massengill Company in, in Bristol, Tennessee. The chief pharmacist was a guy by the name of Harold Watkins who um, found that uh, sulfonamide would dissolve quite well in diethylene glycol. And uh, it gave a satisfactory flavor, appearance, and fragrance. There was no safety testing at that time. It was not required by the FDA. And there were 633 shipments all over the world, including uh, all over uh, uh, the US, including the Georgia. And, um, and this accounted for at least 100 deaths, mostly in children. And a result of this, 1938, uh, approved a drug and cosmetic act, increasing the FDA's authority, and uh, this increased authority of the FDA demanding safety testing likely prevented the thalidomide disaster. About that, the thalidomide disaster. Thalidomide was a drug that caused horrific malformations, uh, uh, focomelia, the absence of, of limbs in children in the 60s. And this was uh, 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 created by Camille Grunenthal in Germany and they got a 20-year patent in 1954 and then marketed it as Gripex um, in 1956. But then, in 1957, it was marketed as an antiemetic for pregnant women for, uh, to use for uh, 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 morning sickness without any safety testing or, or anything in humans. And uh, within a few years, it was taken off the market in Europe. Thankfully, thanks to the efforts of a heroine in the history of medicine, Francis Kelsey, America was not affected except for a small number of patients involved in clinical trials for safety. Uh, despite enormous pressure, this woman, in a time where women didn't belong in medicine, where, uh, where uh, she was uh, uh, bullied uh, by, by men, something obviously that would never ha happen in this uh, day and age, um, uh, was, was bullied into trying to push through this, uh, this medication. And she stood her ground, and she would not uh, uh, let this medicine through. And she had the backing of another heroine in, in the history of medicine, Dr. Helen Tausig of Johns Hopkins, who uh, was the uh, inventor, pediatric cardiologist, inventor of the, uh, of the Blaylock Tausig Thomas uh, shunt, which is obviously another uh, wonderful uh, and beautiful story. So as a result of her efforts preventing thalidomide from uh, entering the United States, she was awarded by, uh, by Kennedy the uh, Award for Distinguished Federal Civilian Service. She was a Canadian. Uh, as a result of, uh, of, of this increased authority and, and the, uh, the increased concerns for teratogenic effects in, um, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, in babies and pregnant women, for several decades, all women of childbearing age were eliminated, excluded from uh, clinical trials. And uh, it was mostly, uh, mostly uh, um, uh, men who were enrolled in, the, um, in clinical trials for, for a long time. And this is more part of the reason why we don't have much, much in terms of safety data for, uh, for uh, medications in pregnant people. Switching gears, another story is about conflicts of interest. And sometimes it's not a bad thing 
to have conflicts of interest in your work. And this is the story of Dr. Walton Lillehei, who is a giant in heart surgery. Uh, one of the, the fathers of surgery, the inventor of the cardiopulmonary bypass machine, um, one of the first people to repair ASDs, VSDs, tetralogy below. I actually have a couple of patients in my clinic who are still alive and were operated on by uh, Dr. Lillehei of the University of Minnesota. So in, just as he was completing his surgical residency at the University of Minnesota, he came down with a large parotid mass and was diagnosed with a uniformly fatal uh, condition, uh, parotid lymphosarcoma. And his mentor, Dr. Owen uh, uh, Augustine, uh, Wangestein, did surgery on him the day after he finished his surgical residency. And uh, he removed a large part of his of his neck and face, and he had a sort of tilt in his neck for the longest time. Um, and the radiation would give him cataracts, which would cut his uh, surgical career uh, short. But he was given a very grim prognosis. And so Dr. Lillehei was in a hurry. And he was in a hurry to get stuff done. And he was, uh, he was tasked with, the, uh, with solving the uh, heart surgery, uh, heart surgery uh, situation. And he was the very first to use heart surgery with controlled cross-circulation, that is, attaching the uh, child with the heart condition to their parent as a, as a cardiopulmonary bypass machine. And then he used, was the first to use the bubble oxygenator as a cardiopulmonary bypass. And he was able to, as mentioned, close several uh, heart defects. However, particularly with VSDs, there was a problem with transient heart block. And these kids, they go into heart block, and then they would, they would unfortunately die. There were this, these uh, uh, refrigerator-sized uh, pacemakers that people have to wheel around, uh, no battery. So you can imagine if you're walking someone down the hall, going from outlet to outlet, how elevators or stairs were out of the question, and these people would be sort of uh, trapped, held hostage until their heart block resolved, eventually. Uh, once the swelling from the surgery went down. And uh, he was very interested in the work of Dr. Paul Zoll at, uh, at the Beth Israel uh, Hospital in, uh, in Boston. And Dr. Zoll was the very first person to uh, use external pacemaker. Uh, and he was able to save, uh, save several people using external, uh, external pacemaker. And then back in Minnesota, on Halloween 1957, um, there was a power outage. There was a powder outage in the Twin Cities, and one of his babies, who was connected to, uh, who was connected to a uh, a uh, uh, pacemaker, uh, died as a result. So he decided to solve this problem. He was always in a hurry to solve this problem. So he went to the engineers at the hospital, and they decided they didn't want to be involved at all in this project at all. They didn't. They were unionized. They didn't want to go down to the operating room. They didn't want to see the side of blood. They didn't have to do it. So he knew of this handyman, this guy who fixed TV sets and beds and some simple medical equipment in the hospital, a guy who worked out of his garage in Minnesota, um, a guy who founded this company with a very funny name, Medtronic, at that time. Uh, and he tasked him with the problem of figuring out how to uh, fix pacemakers, how to make a pacemaker. And he produced, uh, he produced, uh, and it was none other than doctor, uh, than, uh, not a doctor, an engineer, Earl Bakken. And he had this revolutionary idea of inserting an electric, an electronic transistor metronome uh, to keep rhythm, uh, to keep rhythm, uh, and he put in a battery, and now these kids could actually be moving around with this pacemaker that would not go out if the power went down and uh, would allow them to be a little bit more mobile. And um, uh, Earl Bakken and, uh, and uh, Lillehei were getting ready to, to get the technology ready for the first implantable pacemaker. Um, and uh, uh, one of the biggest investors in this company, Medtronic, was none other than, uh, than uh, Lillehei. Uh, and then later he would, uh, he would uh, once his medical career, surgical career was done because of cataracts, he went on to St. Jude and was the, uh, one of the co-inventors of the St. Jude 
uh, valve, which we still use today. The first implantable pacemaker was done in Sweden on a guy by the name of Arne Larsen. Arne had myocarditis and bradycardia, and several times a day he would collapse on the floor, and his wife would rush to his aid, pounding on his chest. And whether because or in spite of her efforts, he would survive and revive. Uh, but she knew it was only a matter of time before one day he could not be revived and his bradycardia heart block would, uh, would cause his death. And she knew of uh, this pacemaker technology and she knew that at the, um, at the Karolinska Institute, there were a couple of guys who were working on this, including Dr. Elmquist and Dr. Senning, um, uh, uh, working on the first implantable uh, pacemaker. So she went and she begged them, she beseeched them to do this first pacemaker. They initially declined, it wasn't ready, until she finally uh, won her case, and they took him as a, as, a, uh, as a desperation effort. They took him, and it required an open sternotomy, putting leads on the surface of the chest, an abdominal uh, uh, generator, and this generator, if you look, it's in, within an epoxy, and it has an identical shape to a kiwi shoe polish uh, canister which is what they used to create the mold. And uh, it was initially not successful. The leads failed and, the, and the, it failed and then they took him back to the operating room within, within a few hours and then a few days later, but he survived 26 pacemakers and he would live longer than Elmquist or Dr. Uh, Senning. Uh, and he died of melanoma in 2001, decades later. Um, uh, also of interest, uh, Siemens Alima, first implantable pacemaker, was sold to uh, St. Jude in uh, 1994. Just a quick, brief note on Dr. Senning. Dr. Senning, after he was at the Karolinska, was in Switzerland, and uh, he was the chief of heart surgery in Zurich. And while he was there, there was this East German guy with a mustache, radiologist who had this idea of inflating balloons and coronary arteries and was successful doing it in pigs and had lined up the first patient to get it done. And there was uniform resistance to the idea until Dr. Senning said, let the young man try. And the young man tried and obviously that was Andreas Grinsick, the father of angioplasty. Um, the Senning operation was the very first operation for uh, arterial uh, for uh, uh, detransposition and it would later be modified into the mustard operation, technically a little bit easier than the uh, sending operation. So um, time has run out and we have some, just some few final thoughts. I hope you don't mind that I share them. And these come from a couple of quotes from uh, Voltaire. First one is, the art of medicine consists of amusing the patient while nature cures the disease. And the second quote is, doctors are men or women who prescribe medicines of which they know little to cure diseases of which they know less in human beings of whom they know nothing. And uh, I think we've come a little bit since the times of Voltaire, but we still have a long way to go. And I have some questions to, to contemplate, not answers, simply, simply questions to contemplate. Is the medical profession an art or a science? Profession comes from profes professionum, to take an oath. Doctors, nurses, pharmacists, uh, we all take an oath. We are uh, 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 professionals. My views are that medicine is an art that uses science, a flawed art, a flawed science, and that is even to this day obviously entrenched in dogma. And we shouldn't ever ignore the force of our misconceptions that persuade us to ignore best evidence if it does not corroborate our current beliefs. Perfect example is Dr. Virchow, brilliant, brilliant man, brilliant man who completely dismissed the idea of particles, germs causing, uh, causing disease. So in many ways, even today, you know, evidence-based medicine, uh, we're sort of, uh, we sort of view medicine through uh, the lens, uh, through the prism of our own biases. And uh, maybe in some way, even today with evidence-based medicine, maybe it is a little bit of a popularity contest. 
uh, you know, we look to our teachers, we look to our, uh, we look to our mentors and follow their lead. That's one of the reasons why I love working with medical students. Their brains have not yet been corrupted by dogma. I love working with medical students. They, I learn so much. I learned, don't, don't tell medical students, but I learn more from them than they do from me simply from the questions that they ask. Because some of the questions that they ask completely blow away some of the, uh, uh, some of the, uh, the dogma that and as soon as they're interns, it's all over. Uh, <laughs> This is a survival mechanism. But how do we avoid ignoring the unexplainable, the inconvenient, the unprofitable, or the uh, unpopular? And um, can pride sometimes cloud our, our judgment? Certainly, I think it does. The other question I have is, is our certain, our current funding mechanisms. If you, you know, Dr. Carl Link, his ability to completely change his gears, uh, change gears and figure out what caused uh, what caused the cows to be bleeding to death and, and led to the discovery of warfarin. Right now, I would argue that maybe our funding mechanisms today favor the conformists and not so much the renegades among us. Even the way uh, uh, grants are graded, et cetera, it, it favors the, uh, the conformist and renegade ideas are, are often uh, dismissed. Obviously, we shouldn't latch on to every crazy idea we come across, but I do think we could be keeping a, a better open mind than we are today all our funding, are, are our funding mechanisms nimble enough? And then when it comes to regulation, do we have too much regulation? Do we have too little regulation? Certainly we need regulation. But is, uh, are all the different uh, alphabet soup of regulatory agencies, are they adequate? Or could we be doing this a little bit more streamlined, more efficient way? And then, you know, obviously we live in, a, in an era of evidence-based medicine. We, our medicines work, we know they do. We have clinical trials that show that our medicines work. But how well do they work, really? If you look at a clinical trial that enrolled thousands of patients to eke out a p-value of less than 0.01, is that, is that really uh, clinically meaningful, clinically significant? And I think we should uh, take, a, take a deeper dive. Instead of looking at just the, at just the uh, relative risk reduction, we should look at absolute risk reduction, number needed to treat and actually take appropriate, um, uh, uh, just a thoughtful, a thoughtful uh, a realization that our medicines today work, but not nearly as well as, as we think they do. This is, this is from uh, a summary from some of the heart failure trials, and I'll show you here ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, aldosterone, hydralazine, uh, uh, resynchronization therapy, ICDs, and here's the number needed to treat in 12 months. So to save one life, we got to treat 77 patients with ACE inhibitor, 28 with beta blockers, and so on and so forth. These medicines are good, but they're not awesome. We have a long, long way to go before we cure, uh, before we cure heart failure and, and countless other, other conditions. I use heart failure uh, just in a, in a, as an example. So again, I go back to my take home point, keep an open mind, embrace uncertainty, and question the status quo, be humble, for history is a very harsh judge. Thank you.